Hi, how's everybody doing? Hopefully not too much uh, food coma from lunch. Um, my name is Robbie Young. Uh, I run a studio called Animoca Brands. Um, we're part of the bigger Animoca group and I focus primarily on um, both publishing and also uh, creating games uh, using licensed intellectual property because we have a relatively big IP portfolio. Uh, we have a global uh, distribution uh, footprint, um, so we've been reasonably successful over the years, um, both here in Asia, around the region, as well as in North America and Europe. Uh, so today, specifically, I think for a little counterpoint to uh, Stephen's discussion, um, I'm going to talk about Asian developers going the other way towards the U.S. market and some of the things that Asian developers may want to keep in mind in thinking about approaching the U.S. Uh, US market specifically, but I think some of these things also um, apply to other Western markets in, in Western Europe that have some similar characteristics to the U.S. <coughs> so looking at the U.S. market overall, obviously it's the biggest gaming market in the world for mobile games. Um, we have some of the user numbers here, uh, as well as revenue numbers. I think if you separate it out by platform, um, a lot of people think of the US as really an iOS-driven market. Um, but in fact, the US is number one for um, downloads on both iOS and Android. Uh, it's number one in the world for revenues on iOS, and number two after Japan uh, in terms of revenues on Android. Um, so it's a very big market. Uh, it's growing by 26% year on year. Um, compared to some markets in Asia that may seem low, uh, but keeping in mind at $2.2 billion, that's you know, an incremental five, $600 million a year. So it's a very, very substantial amount of growth. Um, so I think the US is a market that cannot be ignored for anybody who wants to look at doing a, a multi-region or, or global uh, distribution of their game. So let's look at some of the demographics in the U.S. market and see how that compares maybe to some of the things that we're familiar with here in Asia. Uh, the U.S. is relatively evenly split uh, in terms of gender um, between male and female, 48 to 52 percent, and the age range uh, tends to be young professionals. So age 20 to 35 is kind of the sweet spot. Um, but most importantly, and this is I think one of the things that's driving the very large revenues we see in the U.S. market is the income demographic from those users because almost half of the households within this game-playing demographic have household incomes of greater than 50,000 U.S. dollars per year. So a lot of disposable income for in-app purchase, which is good for all of us. Interestingly, and this is actually my personally my favorite slide, um, and I hope that you guys, well, don't worry about the small type. Unfortunately, you can't see that. That's just examples of games in those genres. But if we look at the type of mobile games that are played in the US and break it down, brain and puzzle games lead with big hits like Candy Crush and Angry Birds, etc. Um, followed by card and casino games, arcade games, etc. which you can see yourself on the slide. But I would point actually to the icons on the right hand side and that's the female to male breakdown. And if you look, the five top categories in the US market, four out of five categories, have a higher percentage of female gamers than male. And I think this is a very key trend because, as we all know, there's sort of a stereotype of our industry, which is that it's guys working for gaming companies making games for other guys. But yet, clearly we can see in the world's biggest market that the demographics are actually um, quite evenly matched, and in this case, by top genres skewed in favor of women. So, then we can look at some of the Asian developed games that have had strong success in the US market. Um, and we can see here that, you know, obviously, with the exception of Flappy Bird, um, the other ones are clearly hardcore games from big established studios. Um, and these are games that I think, you know, I, I like to think about um, how you atta attack certain niche audiences. And in this case, these are games that I think attacked the niche audiences in North America who like Asian style hardcore games and then they built upon that initial audience to broaden the appeal of the game. Um, but I think it's interesting that there is always that core demographic who is interested in those Asian style games and that's a niche that you can build on top of. But if you compare this to the last slide, you don't see a whole lot of games for female audiences up there. So, where do US mobile gamers play? Here's another clear, 
clear differentiator. They play at home. They don't play on public transport. They don't play when they're out. I mean, they do, but in much, much smaller numbers. The vast majority, 84%, play at home in the quiet and the privacy of their own home. So this is a very different game style. So, for example, things to keep in mind that the US gamer tends to play landscape because they don't have to hold on to the train, right? Whereas in Japan, everybody likes to play portrait, for example. Um, and so those kind of considerations affect where it is that gamers are, are, are playing their games. When you look at the platforms in the US, and I, I've put the, some numbers from China up here as well, just to offer a little bit of comparison uh, with a big market in our region. Um, Android and iOS are relatively evenly matched in the US by um, penetration. So um, Android is 50% to iOS is 43%. Um, and of course, China is much the opposite way because China is generally considered an Android market with nearly 80% penetration. However, I would point out that the growth rate, China's Android is growing at 5% versus 8% in the US. So in fact, Android in the US is growing very strongly. Um, so for those of you who have large portfolios of, of Android optimized games that you're selling here in Asia, um, I think that they have a lot of potential as the US continues to grow as an Android market. Distribution, again, giving a little bit of counterpoint. Um, ironically, for a lot of things, China is known to have monopolies, but in this case, it's actually the US that has the monopolies. Um, so in China, distribution is extremely fragmented on, on Android, and you have to work with a lot of different partners. But the good news is, for those of you used to working in China, then going over to the US, it's very simple. You work with Google, you work with Amazon, and you can cover basically the entire market. So distribution is much more straightforward. However, in China, if you're thinking about how to promote your games and how to acquire users, you generally work with these same platforms because the platforms themselves are the ones that are helping you in user acquisition and marketing. The US is quite the opposite. So in the US, and frankly, this is just a sort of cherry-picked sample of major vendors, but for user acquisition, advertising, monetization, you know, it's possible to work with 50 different companies. Um, and so you need to, if you want to help push your apps up the charts and get users into your apps and trying them out, um, then we would recommend that you should work with one or many of these companies. Um, and I think that you see that for larger product launches, often um, developers will include, you know, typically five, even 10 of these partners um, for user acquisition. Um, and so that becomes quite a task in and of itself. Also, social media is very effective for distribution. So here I use the example of Facebook. Um, so we use social media both as a company on a corporate basis, as well as for individual game titles. So for example, we have about 75,000 followers of our corporate um, Facebook profile. And we use that to engage our audience and give them information about new launches and new releases, et cetera. Um, but Stargirl, which is an app that we're reasonably well known for, um, has over a million likes and has a very vibrant community of Stargirl fans who don't just use Facebook Connect to connect into the game, but also use the Facebook web profile um, to talk to other gamers and for us to help build and, and enrich the community that way. So it's a very useful platform. Um, and of course, in addition to Facebook, you know, other social media platforms are very useful for user acquisition, be it Twitter, Google+, et cetera. Um, so highly recommend that in the US market, um, social media integration is very important, um, which is not to say it's not important elsewhere. Um, now let's look at monetization. Um, one characteristic of the US market, I think, which is a differentiator, is that uh, in-app purchase um, is actually not the, uh, the only source of gaming revenue. Um, there are paid games, and then there's also a substantial amount of advertising revenue in games. So if you look at this uh, chart, which goes out to 2017, um, the one thing that you notice, aside from solid growth, is relatively even distribution. So interestingly, the US market is a market that is not just freemium driven. There are you know, substantial revenues to be made from paid games, and also substantial revenues um, from ad support. 
Um, and I think that this is a big differentiator for some of us who are used to Asian markets where you know, your gaming revenue may be maybe 80% from in-app purchase because it's a very freemium driven market. Um, if we look by comparison, again, I'm using China as a comparison because it's a sort of a good analog um, to the US. Uh, obviously, China is overwhelmingly freemium with 94%, sorry, it's hard, a little bit hard to read the numbers there, 94% freemium apps to 4% um, paid apps. Uh, whereas the U.S. is 79% freemium apps. Um, that having been said, freemium apps are on the rise in the U.S. Um, so I think that that's part of one, of one of the major growth drivers in the U.S. market because while there is a vibrant paid and ad-supported segment, freemium continues to grow because freemium apps, you know, at the beginning of 2012 were probably only about 50% of the apps available, in this case in the iOS app store, um, versus about 80% of the apps available in the App Store in January of this year. So in a two-year time scale, um, that, that almost doubled. Um, and then in, on Android, uh, obviously that's an even more pronounced difference between, um, between freemium apps and, and apps with other revenue models. So here, if we look at average revenue per download of freemium apps, um, the US is right in the middle of the chart with Japan here on the, on the far left, obviously the highest revenue per download, um, and China on the far right uh, with the lowest because obviously China has a huge number of downloads. Um, the one thing that this chart doesn't take into account, of course, is piracy. Um, so if you factor in piracy, which tends to be quite high, particularly in China, um, then obviously that's, that number uh, would be much, much lower if you factored in piracy. So. Let's move on to talk about advertising a little bit. Um, the US is a very, very vibrant advertising market. It's the most mature market for mobile advertising. Um, there are a variety of advertising uh, types available um, and uh, advertising revenue tends to be very, um, a very substantial part of the business model of apps. So while apps still may rely on in-app purchase um, for the, the main part of their revenues, advertising something not to be ignored. Um, and, and so uh, having a good advertising strategy and plan for monetizing advertising is very important in the US market. Uh, when you look at the types of ads that are available, um, you know, you have interstitials, you have banners, you have full display ads, you have video ads, many different formats. Um, in our experience, we have actually found that um, ads uh, which um, request the user to perform an action in uh, exchange for some type of reward, such as in-game currency, um, are extremely effective in the U.S. market. Um, so that's, that's something that we've learned there. Uh, I talked earlier about looking at niches. Another thing to consider is the niche of Asian Americans. Um, in the U.S., there are roughly 12 million Asian Americans across different uh, ethnic communities. Um, in my mind, this is a place where, as an Asian developer, you can consider entering the market um, and targeting particularly um, a niche community here, in this case, who is perhaps predisposed to the content style that you already have in an existing game you've distributed in your home market. Um, just like we see you know, the growth of messaging platforms like Kakao and Line and WeChat in North America that begin within the ethnic community and then expand beyond that. Um, I think we found the same thing is true for game styles. Um, so I think definitely you can look towards uh, your own ethnic communities as uh, an interesting niche beachhead to, to tap into the market. If you look at that Asian demographic in America, uh, Asian Americans have higher median household income, so more disposable income. Uh, and also, they tend to be early adopters of technology. Um, so that also makes them key influencers within their communities um, because they tend to be early adopters. Um, I mean, just sort of a casual observation, if you ever go around Silicon Valley and talk to big internet companies, how many of the people who run mobile are not Asian American? So there is a sort of a predisposition within the ethnic community which I think favors our industry uh, in North America. And lastly, let me talk about art style. Um, and this goes back, I was thinking about your slide, Stephen, actually, because you put up something similar. Um, 
Our game, Star Girl, originally uh, had a very Western look and feel, um, which actually worked well both in Asia as well as North America. And then we launched Beauty Idol on the left. Oh, sorry, a little pixelated. Um, which is essentially similar gameplay style, but, uh, but different graphical style. So we used more of a traditional uh, anime theme. Uh, and what that did was it allowed us to tap into a niche market that enjoys that anime style um, and introduce to them the gameplay from the existing Stargirl game. So we expanded the market for an existing gameplay style by changing art styles. Um, and the last example I'll give you for art style is a game that we did using Astro Boy, uh, which is a well-known, you know, sort of classic uh, Japanese brand from Tetsuka. Um, but Astro Boy has a niche fan base audience in the U.S., um, and that niche fan base began, sort of, was the the beachhead for which um, we gained a lot of momentum for this particular app in the U.S. because we found there were a lot of existing Astro Boy fans. Um, and so that was an interesting way for us to bring something from Asia into the U.S. market um, and, and expand on the theme of Astro Boy by using an endless running format that uh, is really popular in the market. So I think just to recap, when thinking about the, the U.S. market, um, number one, revenue, the world's largest market. So I think it's difficult to ignore. Um, distribution is relatively straightforward because, you know, between Android and iOS, basically you have three app stores, um, so that's very straightforward. Um, Western audiences are willing to pay for apps, they're willing to um, pay in-app purchases, and, and, uh, and they're also willing to um, click on sponsored advertisements. So I think that the market is very well developed and very mature in the respect of being willing to pay for games. Um, especially in-game advertising, which is more mature, so you also have multiple revenue opportunities um, over and above simply in-app purchase. Um, but as far as thinking about getting into the market, um, you have to have, make sure you have the right kind of game. You have to make sure what type of audience you're looking for. Um, I encourage those of you who are developing hardcore games to think about mid-core and, and casual games. Um, I encourage you to take into account perhaps female gaming audiences because they are a very large portion of the market in the U.S. Um, and also be smart and think about what type of partners you want to use for distribution and user acquisition, whether it's social media on the one hand or the um, myriad uh, user acquisition uh, and advertising networks available in the U.S. Um, because user acquisition is very competitive um, it can get expensive, uh, and so you need to use your partners wisely. Um, but you can just go outside because I think they're all here, so they'd be happy to happy to get to know you. So that's what I have to say about the U.S. markets. Um, if anybody has questions, uh, please. How do you tap into Asian American the Asian American market? Yes. Okay. Um, I think the reason I brought up Asian Americans is because. Uh, being able to attract them into the game um, is less of a question of localization. So there's, it doesn't really require you necessarily to do much in terms of gameplay style, except perhaps you know localizing the language into English. Um, I think in that case it becomes more about demographics and user acquisition. So I think you need to you need to utilize your uh, social media. Um, channels and your user acquisition network smartly to try to target that particular demographic. Um, but in terms of localization of the game, I think um, with the Asian American community, it's it's safe to say that you it doesn't require much localization at all. Um, that can be. I mean, I think also it, it helps represent a bit of a cost savings if you want to do a bit of a test um, and see if if the game is is interesting to that audience. What are the most popular genres in America, uh, gaming genres? Uh, puzzle games. This puzzle, uh, like, is there like a second place or a third place? Uh, card games and casino games, uh, followed by arcade and action games. Uh, but overwhelmingly puzzle games. So 
So I think you, uh, you and Stephen both touch on um, our style, and I love your uh, examples. But um, sort of just to follow up a little bit on the general question, is there any genres that you would think, well, as, as Asian developers, it's actually high risk when you port that kind of genre or game design to the Western, uh, Western market? Or anything can go. Um, um, I don't think that there's a genre risk, but there's definitely a theme risk. So, I, and I'm not trying to pick on Chinese developers per se, but China seems to have an endless appetite for Three Kingdoms themed games. Correct. Um, and I think that that's something that maybe the rest of the world has less tolerance for because it's not part of their culture. Um, so I think that you know what we've done in the past because um, we also publish, so we've taken Three Kingdoms themes and changed them to you know Western military themes or something that has similar s strategic type of gameplay, right. um, but with a different cultural theme. Right. But then in terms of the themes, uh, do you would you give Asian developers a some recommendations about like what themes would be popular? Or possibly popular in in the Western market, like we have vampire, we have sci-fi, we have uh, high fantasy. Um, sure, I think um, definitely fantasy, as we've seen with uh, all of the sort of Lord of the Rings and knights and and Western sort of historical themes. Um, farming seems to be popular everywhere in the world. I guess because there's farmers everywhere, um, but farming is outrageously popular on mobile. Um, and, and of course, I think city builders are always popular, um, which is, I think, less about the theme of, of the people characters than, than actual construction. Um, so I think all of those are relatively safe themes. There is a lot of risk in, in uh, publishing our games into the United States. Uh, you just mentioned that there are uh, 4 million Chinese Americans. Uh, that's still uh, quite a small number compared to the uh, hundreds of millions of uh, Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, now, to promote the game in United States, it takes a lot of money to just stand up, to just show up and people actually download the games and all that stuff. Yeah. Now, how do you measure actually uh, compared the risk that you take with, with the theme risk compared to uh, the effort that we need to do to actually promote the game into uh, something that people can see. Because uh, if did, did actually the Asian American market actually drive by the non-Asian American market? Um, I think the way I like to think about it is Asian Americans are an interesting niche. So I think that it's possible if you want to test your product, you can test it out within the Asian American community because they will have a, they will be your early adopters of things that have Asian gameplay styles. So in that case, there's less investment required for the U.S. if you're not having to do as much localization of the game itself. User acquisition is a separate story. User acquisition is always going to be expensive um, in any relatively mature market. It's very expensive in Korea and Japan and getting more expensive in Taiwan as well. Um, I would argue though that I think the risk reward profile is relatively similar in all of those markets that I just mentioned um, because it's expensive and difficult to get users in Japan and Korea but it's worth it when you get them because they pay well. Um, I think the US maybe for Asian developers is just less familiar so it feels as though the the trade-off is, is not there. So I think um, careful research, um, obviously, you know, you can work with a publishing partner. I, I'm not, we do that, although I'm not pitching our services particularly in that. Um, but I, I recommend, you know, if you do have um, concerns about that, then working with a publishing partner is a very good way to take a toe in the water approach and learn about the market initially before going, in, going it alone. Because I think that on the user acquisition side, um, because they're, for the same reason that Western developers tend to work with a publishing partner in China, because there are so many platforms to work with, um, and relationships with the platforms can be important. Uh, in the US market, because there are so many monetization networks and user acquisition networks, the reverse can also be true in the US. Okay, I think we're uh, out of time, so if anyone else wants to talk to Robbie, he'll be around. Just come look for him. Great. Thank you very much.